third and final chapter for Weld 1770. This is chapter 23 out of your text. Begins on page 855. Um, this chapter actually runs pretty long, but we're only going to go through page 877. We're going to stop at submerged arc welding. Um, so if you'll turn to page 855, I have a couple of bulleted items in, on this first page. Reading from the top of the page, it says, Flux cord arc welding, FCAW, has grown very rapidly. This growth has kept pace with the growth of other gas metal arc welding processes. The biggest use is in the fabrication of medium to heavy weldments of carbon and alloy steel. Flux cord wire increases the welding speeds and deposition rates considerably over other types. Uh, what I want you to take away from that is the definition. If you see FCAW, you should know that it means flux cord arc welding, and also that it's big claim to fame, it's high deposition rates, and also penetration, has great penetration. Down a little bit lower, this is a bullet. There are two basic types of flux cord wire. They are the gas shielded flux cord arc welding, which is FCAW-G, and the self shielded flux cord arc welding, FCAW-S. Remember those two definitions. Um, so what's so great about them? Well, they combine all the advantages of gas metal arc welding, such as high deposition rates, good, good performance on fillets and groove welds. There's scavengers and the oxidizers in the uh, material for less, less cleaning. Produces a slag that retards the cooling rate and supports the molten weld pool. And FCAW has the ability to weld in all positions with the correct electrode, which is why we can actually weld pipe with it. FCAWG is a process using a continuous consumable electrode to do gas shielded flux cord arc welding. Its core is filled with flux and alloying agents. You should remember that. These types of electrodes require an external shielding gas. The solid metal portion of the electrode comprises about 80 to 85 percent of its weight and the core material makes up the remainder and performs the following functions. So read those bulleted items. Uh, basically it's an inside out welding electrode is what it is. And uh, uh, all the alloying elements are in there. It has stabilizers in there to, to, to help with the arc. It adds alloying elements, uh, provides shielding and so forth and so on. So read and understand that. Flux cord arc welding dash self shielded is a process employing a continuous consumable electrode that has its core filled with flux, gasifiers, and alloying agents. These electrodes generate their own shielding gas and require no external shielding. Uh, if you look at the, the, the two figures there on your text, in your textbook, these are the two. And you should get used to being able to look at these types of pictures and recognize from the picture what type of welding process they're talking about. Um, here we have a gas nozzle, wire guide and contact tube, shielding gas, tubular electrode, and then powdered metal, flux, slag, forming materials, and so forth and so on. Uh, down here, we don't have a gas nozzle. So we can tell these are both flux cord because they have a tubular electrode, so we know it's a flux core. No other process has a tubular electrode. Uh, with alloying elements and deoxidizers and so forth on the inside, but this one has a gas nozzle and a shielding gas, and this one does not. So we can tell from these two pictures which is which. Now you may get these pictures in, on your test, and uh, I'll, be, I'll ask you to identify. I may even throw you a curveball and, and put some gas metal arc in there, a uh, picture of a gas metal arc system in there too, and ask you to identify it. So study those pictures. Uh, so that you can recognize them. And I do this because the American Welding Society does this on their certified welding inspectors test. So you should be able to recognize from these figures what process you're looking at. Okay, going back to your textbook. Let's go to page 858, first column where it says the flux cold electrode was first developed about 1954 and introduced in its present form in 1957. So it's been around almost as long as I have. Flux cord electrodes are available in diameters of 030, uh, 035, 045, 052, 1 16th, and so forth. Uh, typically, the ones that I've used in my career are mostly the 045, and that's what you're using here in, in, in your class, and the 1 16th. 1 16th is getting pretty big, and that deposits an awful lot of metal in any position, but you can still handle it even for overhead welding. Top of the next column. 
Uh, flux cord filler metals are produced on the basis of three categories, single pass filler metals, multiple pass filler metals, and self-shielded filler metals. Uh, this next one is a bullet. The flux cord processes are particularly suited for those applications in which rust and poor fit up are problems. And when larger size fillet welds uh, than those provided by solid cord wires are desired. So that's a bullet. It's actually one of the best things you can do if you have a, a real old steel or rusty steel, stuff that's sitting outside a lot. It takes less cleaning because they put all that oxidizer and uh, deoxidizers and stabilizers in the flux and it's, it's such a huge amount of penetration and high amperages that'll burn a lot of that stuff, all, a lot of those contaminants out of there. Uh, read about these bulleted items down below over on the next page. Bullet, a constant voltage power source with direct current electrode positive is generally used with the continuous feed electrode process. So just like with gas metal arc, you're going to use DCEP and a constant voltage CV uh, welding machine. You may recall that in, in gas metal arc welding with a constant voltage power source, uh, current output is determined by the wire feeder adjustment. A specially designed wire feed and control unit is necessary. Um, there are a variety of different gun styles and so forth. When gas uh, flux core arc welding with gas, wires are used with a shielding gas such as carbon dioxide or argon plus carbon dioxide. Ductility, penetration, and toughness of the weld metal are improved. Flux core arc welding is also superior on dirty or corroded base metals. So there we go again about uh, being pretty, pretty forgiving when you have contaminants around. Uh, again, you're using 7525 gases on this, but it can be run with, with straight uh, CO2. Flux cord electrodes require currents in the range of, of 90 to 960 amps. Because of their deep penetrating qualities and the highly fluid weld pool, the best welds are obtained by welding in the flat and horizontal positions. That's a bullet. Flux cord electrodes are especially intended for large single or multi-pass fillet welds in either the flat or horizontal positions with DCEP. Uh, the wires are also suitable for long groove welds and heavy plate. I once saw a guy, a boiler maker, lay on a belly board, one of these things that you would use to slide underneath your car to work on it. He laid on this thing and sat there and slowly pushed himself along, welding with flux cord arc welding down a 50-foot seam on a, uh, what was it, a precipitator for a power plant. And he never got up. I mean, he was there for two hours just pushing himself, just rolling himself along like this, and he ran a whole spool, 60 pounds of wire, in that position. So it's that continuous feed, and, and it's so forgiving that he could do that. You know, it doesn't matter if there was a little bit of surface rust on there, it would just burn off. So, uh, long groove welds on heavy plate, bullet flux cord electrodes often replace the 7018 and 7028 shielded metal arc electrodes. Flux cord wire weld deposit is fully covered by a dense easily removed slag the combination of full slag coverage and the gas shielded arc results in radiographically sound welds with excellent mechanical properties and it really is a great process the chemical composition of the weld is constant because alloying elements are built into the cord electrode um, flip the page says uh, typical applications include farm equipment truck bodies earth moving equipment ships pressure vessels rubber cars machine bases uh, structural steel, storage tanks, and repair castings. Those are all some things that this process is used for. On page 860, look at the figure down uh, in the lower left-hand corner, figure 2310. It's the same one. And uh, I wanted to draw your attention to this because, yeah, you can put, you can put a, a, a flux core wire in there. Um, and this would be your hopper if you wanted to use a separate flux. This is actually, what, what brought my attention to this is, I've seen these in welding shops before. And if any of you go on and take submerged arc welding, you'll, you'll see something similar to this. We used to call these squirt guns. And your wire comes through here, but also there's a tube in there that forces flux from this hopper. It uses compressed air, and it has, there's a granulated uh, flux in here, and that flux is forced down down this tube along with your wire and you can actually do handheld submerged arc welding with this system. Uh, they put it in this book because you can also put, put uh, uh, dual shield or, or, or uh, self shielded rather 
wire on there and use it for straight, straight uh, flux core arc welding. But I wanted to point this out because you can also do handheld submerged arc welding with it. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, over on the next page, bullet. Even though flux cord electrodes carry an AWS classification number, it does not mean you can necessarily switch between the various manufacturers indiscriminately. Flux, um, flux cord electrodes have personality, which needs to be considered. It is not that one manufacturer's electrodes are better than the others, but they are different. For example, E71T-11 of 045 wire uh, from one manufacturer may require different operating parameters such as electrode extension, arc voltage, amperage, blah, 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 blah. It is, uh, it is best to always consult the manufacturer for the optimum operating uh, conditions. Under the AWS, to get that classification, they have to go through a rigorous testing pro uh, process so that the mechanical properties meet certain criteria. So in that regard, whoever's producing it is still going to ha have a, a, an electrode that meets those mechanical requirements. But each one is going to be a little bit different because they're going to, they may have the shielding a little bit thicker. Uh, they may have the alloying elements just a little bit different. Um, so you want to look at each one. We use Inner Shield. That's a name that you need to remember. Lincoln Inner Shield is what we use. Uh, it's probably the most common, and it's a very, very good uh, electrode. Uh, now let's talk about guns. I only have one slide to show you on during this lecture. And this is it. These are guns. This is a picture of guns. Um, if you look at this, these are both flux cord arc welding guns. This is the kind that you have in your booth. This is a uh, gas shielded flux cord gun and this is a self shielding flux cord gun. You can see the difference in the gun shape. Uh, this one has a gas, gas nozzle attached and this one doesn't. It just has a guide tube to direct the, to direct the uh, wire to where you want it. Um, self shielding usually uses higher amperages and bigger wires and so they have to put this hand, uh, hand shield on there so that you don't burn yourself up. And I brought, I, I disconnected our, our, our gun to bring it in here to show you. And if you look at this, it's exactly the same. Different manufacturer, a little older, but it's still the same. We have the guide tube, we have the, the, uh, the hand shield, we have the trigger to, to feed the wire. So if you see a gun, a picture, and it's this kind of a, kind of a gun, you're going to know that it is self-shielded as opposed to the one that has a gas nozzle on it, which would be a gas shielded type. Uh, let's see, going back to your book. Let's see. Flip to page 864, shielding gas. M-type electrodes, and, and the electrodes that we use are the, are the M-type, require 75 to 80 percent argon with the, with the rest of it being CO2. We use a 75-25. In addition to carbon dioxide, a mixture consisting of 98 percent argon and 2 percent oxygen or 95 percent argon and 5 percent oxygen may be used. This is a bullet. A mixture of 75 percent argon and 25 percent carbon dioxide is also satisfactory. In general, the argon-rich mixtures offer more stable but less penetrating uh, controllable arcs over the 100% CO2. It can be less smoky in operation, but it is also more expensive. As I mentioned previously, a lot of high schools will use straight CO2 because it is less expensive, but most quality code shops are going to use 75-25 uh, or some other combination of gas. Now, I'd like you to look at that overlay, that figure on, on that page. These are different joint designs. Uh, Different joint configurations. It's the same, same thing that's in your book. I wanted to point this out to you because there's, a, there's one in particular I wanted to draw your attention to and I want you to pay attention to it. And it's this one up here in the upper right hand corner. This is called a single bevel because one end is a square groove and the other member is beveled. Okay? And if you look here it says one inch maximum. This is straight out of, the, out of the American Welding Society D1.1 Structural Welding Code. If you wanted to take uh, uh, the AWS Unlimited Thickness Plate Test so that you could be a qualified plate welder, 
this is the test you would take. So I want you to remember that because I'm going to put a question on your test asking about all these different uh, joint fit-ups and I'm going to ask you which one of these joint fit-ups would you have to take if you were taking the AWSD 1.1 structural welding code unlimited thickness plate test you are going to answer a one inch thick single bevel groove weld this one here now here we have this is one quarter of an inch so this is a square groove butt joint this is a square groove butt joint this one here is a double bevel because this member is beveled on both sides and the other member is square and here we have another double bevel but this one has a 45 degree bevel angle and this one has a 35 degree bevel angle two different ways of, of prepping it and usually it's based on thickness of the material uh, or sometimes they'll have one member that's thicker than the other one now here you can see that this member is beveled and this member is beveled so this would be called a double V groove because if you look at it if you look at just half of it that looks like a V and if you look at that half of it, that looks like a V. So we have two V's, so that's called a double V groove. When you're welding with your 3 8 inch plate, you're welding a single V groove. So study this page, because I'm going to use some of these terms, but it's all going to lead up to this question right here. Okay, going back to your, to your book, um, page 867, gun angles. It says a push gun angle causes the gas shield to be directed over the molten pool. A portion of the arc is insulated from the base metal by the molten uh, pool. Less penetration results and a higher and narrow weld bead is deposited. Slag may be forced ahead of the weld pool to the extent that incomplete fusion and slag inclusions may result. A drag angle of 2 to 15 degrees is recommended. Welders usually prefer to use the drag angle because there's a better view of the arc action uh, and the weld being deposited. So there's going to be a question coming out of that about weld angles and I'm going to ask something to the effect of well should you use a push or should you use a drag? Typically you're going to use a drag angle with about a 10 degree drag angle same stuff that we're teaching you in there from time to time you can do a push angle though uh, but again that would be typically for vertical up stuff just like back in gas metal arc welding we typically use the vertical up push in order to do that. Um, yeah, and and, it, and it, it confirms that right here at the very last sentence. It says, generally, a push angle is used only for the 3F, remember F means fillet, or 3G, G means groove, vertical up positions. So that's what we would use that for. Um, electrode preheat. Here they're talking about the electrode extension. If you remember back to our previous talk, uh, the amount of, of, of wire in excess of, that extends beyond the end of the gun, uh, that is your electrode extension. In the case of uh, flux core arc welding, that extension gets preheated before you make contact with the weld metal. And I'm reading uh, from about the third paragraph, fourth paragraph, it says, in flux core arc welding self-shielded, the minimum extension is one-eighth of an inch, and the maximum extension may go as high as four and a half inches. That's a bullet. That's astounding, four and a half inches of extension. With the flux core arc welding self-shielded electrodes, Long extensions are required to properly preheat the electrode before it reaches the welding arc. This preheating activates the gasifying ingredients in the core of the electrode. Kind of excites them, gets them ready to do their job. Preheating helps eliminate hydrogen contamination and porosity. Over on the next page, with the flux core arc welding gas electrodes, the external shielding gas may be lost if the extension is excessive and the gas nozzle contact tube is not properly adjusted. Uh, excessively long electrode extensions cause spatter, irregular action, uh, incomplete fusion, incomplete penetration, and slag inclusions. So under flux cord arc welding with gas, you don't want to have that huge uh, electrode extension that you do on the self-shielded ones. So that's a bullet in there. Know the difference between those two. Uh, go to page 871 under welding technique, second paragraph. Check the extension distance carefully. Excessive extension reduces the gas shield and overheats the wire. Uh, again, we're talking about flux core arc welding gas. Uh, the arc and the welding area must be properly shielded from drafts that can blow the shielding gas away from the weld area. Do not let the weld metal overheat. If the weld gets too hot, 
The flux on the bead surface is hard to remove. Take particular care not to overheat the weld metal when making multi-pass welds. This is called your interpass temperature. As you're dumping more and more and more and more heat into that thing, that base metal is, is warming up um, until it can get away from you. Most codes or most welding procedures specify a maximum interpass temperature that you can't go over when you're making a weld. Uh, some things will say, okay, well, you want to preheat to 200 degrees. But then you start, you preheat to 200 degrees, then you start welding on it, and particularly on your thicker stuff, um, then that temperature will slowly creep up on you. And suddenly you're welding, you, you, it, it's, the base metal is heated to 700 degrees before you ever strike a heart, uh, an arc on it. So now that's too high. When you get up to those temperatures, you're changing the structure of the steel. So you have to watch that maximum interpass temperature so that you don't do that. It's all about getting a good weld with the correct mechanical properties. So also be very careful to remove all the flux from the underneath passes when making multi-pass welds. Make use of all of the welding skills that you have learned up to this point in order to ensure sound welds and good appearance. Uh, you will find that the arc is smooth, steady, and essentially spatter free when operated at the proper wire speed, feed, and voltage settings. It is also forceful and penetrating. This is a bullet. The arc transfer has a semi-spray characteristic and the arc appears to be buried in the pool. The weld deposits are even lower in hydrogen than those made with the low hydrogen stick electrode. So there's lower hydrogen in, in, in the flux core, pardon me, in the self-shielded uh, flux core arc welding electrodes than there is in 7018. The chief source of any hydrogen and porosity in the weld deposit is moisture absorbed from the metal surfaces or from the electrode itself. Flip the page, a couple of bullets here. Spatter may be caused by an arc that is too long. In such a case, the voltage setting is too high. Another possible cause of spatter is poor arc stability at low wire feed speeds. This can be corrected by increasing the wire feed speed or by shortening the extension. Normal voltage is 29 to 35 volts, but higher voltages may be needed if the welding cables are long. So the longer the welding cables, uh, you may need to up the voltage a little bit. Remember, the voltage is what push, puts the force behind the amperage. Uh, groove welding, you're reminded to make sure that smooth, even penetration is obtained at the root of the weld. The bead should be equally proportioned and fused to the root face and to the bevel face of each beveled piece. Pay particular attention to the width of the bead formation so that it is not more than one sixteenth of an inch on each side. Um, remember, we've talked about this many times. When you've got your weld like this with your backing strip, and you're laying that in there, you want to tie it to the shoulder of the bevel, the shoulder of the bevel, and the backing strip. Complete fusion. What your book is saying is, don't come over here more than about a sixteenth of an inch. Don't come over onto the, the uh, fusion edge any more than you have to. So about a sixteenth of an inch, sixteenth of an inch, and so forth. Finally up here at the top, a sixteenth of an inch. So if you go wider than that, you're just going to cause problems. Remember, the wider the bead, the more stress that you set up in the weld. So just enough to tie in on each pass. Keep each pass clean. Make sure you fuse into each successive pass. Um, under inspection and testing, a bunch of bulleted items there. There will be one question coming out of those bulleted items. So read those. Uh, it's acceptance criteria, acceptance what they're looking for. When using the flux core arc welding gas electrodes, Gases may become trapped between the solidifying weld pool and a slag layer. Now, this is very important. I get this question all the time. So pay attention. I will ask a question on this. This gas causes longitudinal surface depression in the face of the weld. This type of discontinuity is often referred to as a worm track. And we just got, I just came back from a seminar in San Diego not long ago in which we discussed this very problem. What happens is you've got your weld like so, and you're welding up here like this, and suddenly you get a little, a little ching of on the, on the top of your weld like that, and you go, what the heck is that? This is what they're talking about. This is a worm track. And let's read that. It, it, this bears reading again. Let's read that again. It says, when using flux core arc welding gas electrodes, gases may become trapped between the solidifying weld pool and the slag layer. So it's, it's caught. You've got your weld metal here, and you've got these gases coming up, and the slag is solidifying on top. Well, these gases get trapped in here, and they, put, they exert a force down here onto the parent metal, and that causes this little, this little worm track because it's, it's just caught between there. So this gas causes a longitudinal surface depression in the face of the weld. 
This type of discontinuity is, is referred to as a worm track. If there is no evidence of porosity, a wormhole at either end of the track depression, these tracks need not be considered detrimental to the overall joint. If it's just on the surface like that, not a problem. But here, let, let me do a little blow up of it. But if you got it like this, and you see a hole right here, then that probably means that that goes down into the weld metal itself. So that, in that case, you'd have to fix it. But if it's just on the surface, it's usually not a problem, except for appearance purposes. The thing you have to watch on this thing is the end condition. Remember in our last talk we talked about criticality of defects? Well, if the end condition is really sharp, then that would be a problem. Even if it's on the surface, you don't want a sharp end condition because that could cause problems. So you would want to take your grinder and just hit it a little bit. Worm tracks, yeah, you're probably going to see, see some of those. It says, however, tracks do not detract, uh, pardon me, however, tracks do detract from the appearance of the weld and it, if appearance is important, corrective action may be required. So just hit it with your grinder. Uh, it, also right here it says, uh, see table 23.4, uh, for some troubleshooting pointers, I checked that out, and that's wrong. Uh, it's, it's just the previous page. It's actually 23.6, and this is what you'll find when you turn to 23.6. It's a little troubleshooting guide, um, voids and cracks, uh, penetration too, uh, too deep or too shallow, porosity in gas pockets, undercutting, uh, longitudinal depression in the weld face, and, and, and it's just some things that you can check possible causes over here. So if you're seeing those things, go ahead and turn to that page, which is uh, back on page 870. Just flip the page, you'll see it, and that'll help give you some corrective actions that you can take. Okay, let's see, what else do we have? Flux cord arc welding self-shielded. Um, the AWS accepted term for this welding process is flux cord arc welding self-shielded, I've already talked about that, I will ask you about that definition. Uh, inner shield is the electrode that we use, it is a, if it's inner shield, it's a self-shielded. If it's dual shield, which is, a, which is another trade name, that is, that is a gas shielded and a, and, a, and a flux core. So know those two names. Uh, in inner shield, uh, the process, this is a process produced by a special electrode shield uh, the molten weld metal during welding operation, the flux cord electrode is a continuous wire uh, that also serves as a filler metal. Uh, turn the page. The tubular steel wire filler contains all the necessary ingredients for sh shielding, deoxidizing, and fluxing. These materials melt at a lower temperature than the steel electrode metal and form a vapor shield around the arc and, and molten weld metal. Also included in the electrode are the alloying materials needed to provide high-grade weld metal. Electrodes are available for all welding positions. Process advantages. Uh, you can see that there's a number of bulleted items on page 874 about the advantages of flux core arc welding. Read through those. I'm, I'm going to ask a question uh, concerning those. I may ask you to name two or three of those things, name two or three of those advantages. Over on the next page, power sources. Um, there'll be a question coming out of there. It says, Many of these self-shielded type electrodes are very voltage sensitive. As little as one half of a volt above or below their effective voltage range can create problems such as weld appearance, improper weld profile, and a reduction of mechanical and or physical properties. Um, that kind of jumps out at you. It's that sensitive that a half a volt makes that much difference. So that will be a question. Uh, guns, we've already talked about guns. There's medium, light, and heavy duty guns. I've already shown you those. We talked about electrical extension already. Flip the page where it says operating variables. There'll be a bullet coming out of there. Four major variables affect the welding performance with self-shielded electrodes. Uh, they are the arc voltage, the current, the travel speed, and the electrode extension. Uh, these are all interdependent and if one is changed, one or more of the others will require adjustment. And then under inspection and testing, uh, read those seven, eight items under, under inspection and testing. Uh, again, we're looking at acceptance cr cr criteria for visual inspection, and I want to ask you about that. And that brings us to the end of this topic. Uh, don't go beyond submerged arc welding on page 877. That's another class. 
So if you have any questions or if I haven't explained everything thoroughly on this, it's probably going to be a 20 question test. Not going to be real tough, uh, but there are some important things that you need to, need to remember about flux cord arc welding uh, as we move forward. So uh, get me if you have any questions and I'll be happy to explain things. Thank you very much.